welcome to Math Math Method. In another episode, I wrote a pong game from scratch. And to be honest, the timing and mechanism we used was shit. There is a lot of bad timing code out there for games. So I'm really sad at the contributor to this. This is what happens when you unlock the game to 60 frames per second. Whee! However, I'm going to try to rectify myself by explaining what's wrong with the one we wrote and show how to do it better. Let's get started. Here I have loaded up my pawn game again. You don't have to have gone through the last episode where we write a pawn game. So if you haven't, I'm gonna run you through it quickly. The important things is this callback here to request animation frame. This is where we're gonna do the most of changes. This calls the update method with the change in time since the last request animation frame. And the update method it does everything that the games know how to simulate, so it changes the ball position according to its velocity and the time. It bounces the ball if it reaches a certain point. And it also tests collision with the players. Then lastly, it draws the scene. So first, let's remove the style tag here. Because it's going to be pointless to have. And then we widen the canvas a little bit. So let's check this out. There we go. That's nice to work with. We're also gonna move the paddles in. This paddle is gonna be around here and this is gonna be around here. So up to the player reset. Oh, yeah, player creation. So 200 on both ends. There we go. Let's check it out. It works as, as expected. And now we're gonna add a little bit of instrumentation here. So in the update method, we're gonna run console.log. We're gonna label this delta, and we're gonna print out the delta time here. So now, raise the console, and we should print. So what we see here is that the time fluctuates a lot. It's not a huge amount, but every time we get an input, we get a different time almost. Most of the time, this is not a problem, but I can demonstrate where it is. For example, if I leave this tab and come back, now we should have a timestamp pair that is larger. Yes. So the distance between two render frames was 1.7 seconds here. So what does that mean? Let me illustrate. Back to the code. First, I'm going to disable the automatic update in the callback. And I'm just going to draw. Lastly, I'll turn off draw in the update method. This not only for demo, it's just nice to separate those two things because it's not important to draw the game at all times, only when we can, but the update method is the vital thing for the simulation. Now the game shouldn't simulate. So if I click now, there's nothing happening. We are drawing because as you can see, the user input is moving the player, but the ball is not simulating. And the ball should have a velocity because I clicked. So pong.ball.vel, what is it? Yeah, it has velocity. But since update doesn't run, it doesn't move the ball. We can trigger an update manually. So we say pong.update and I'm gonna give it the time of 1 60th of a second. Okay, it moved a little bit. I'm gonna run this command again so you can see. There we go, so you saw that the ball moved ever so slightly and we printed the delta here. And now the delta was static because we always gave it an exact time here. So now, why is it a problem if we get a large time here? We can try. Let's send in a quarter of a second. 15 sixties. There we go. The ball moves. Not a problem so far. The same thing that would happen if we simulate often is happening in the end, so I don't see the problem. But, now we're gonna tweak it a little bit. A little bit slower now, let's see what's going on. There we go. And now let's say we got a big gap. 
half a second. Whoop! The ball went through the player. Now, why did this happen? It is because on every update, first move the ball, and then later we check the collision with the player. So if we simulate a big enough time, the ball will never collide, it will never overlap with a player, and that's what happened now. Thankfully, there is an elegant cure for this. We're gonna employ this cure in the callback method. First, I want to add a new variable. Let accumulator equals zero. And I want to add a static time step. So we're gonna just say that our game has a time set of 1 sixth. So the same that the request animation frame gives us. But remember, it's just incidental that request animation frame gives 1 sixth. That might not be correct on all platforms and all computers and not all monitors and graphics cards. And it certainly will not be correct in the future. This time step we're gonna use down here. So instead of us sending in the difference in millis that request animation frame gives us, we're gonna add this to the accumulator. Then after the accumulator has been increased, we can make a while loop and we say while accumulator is more than step. Then we run the update method with step. And we decrease the accumulator with one unit of step. I'm also gonna add some instrumentation here now. Console.log accumulator. And we label this ac. Let's see what we get. What's nice here is that we have a rock stable delta and accumulator is very noisy. And that's not a problem because we don't use the accumulator at all. The accumulator just keeps track of how much time we are left to simulate, basically the simulation depth. And as you see it grows a little bit. So sooner or later this will grow so big that it simulates two steps on one request animation frame. That is not a problem. Now let's see what happens if I switch tabs for a while. Let's give it a second or two. Boom, what happened? Here. So, the accumulator was up 2.8 seconds and then we simulated 168 frames. That means that if we had this time difference it wouldn't matter for the game simulation. Everything that happened in our game because of time would be completely solid and deterministic. And this is a huge factor for a game timer. So just to iterate over what we did, because it wasn't much and is hugely beneficial. We add in an accumulator value that can also be named the simulation depth. Then we specify the static time step, 1 60th of a second. And then instead of sending the request animation frame delta to the update method, we just put it on the simulation depth and then we loop through the simulation depth until we don't have any more steps. And then we draw. Another cool thing with this is that we can simulate much more than we draw. And this way we can get a much more accurate simulation. So let's simulate at four times the resolution as we did before. So here we can see for every request animation frame we output the accumulator time. And then for every update method we print the delta. You can see here that delta time is much smaller. It's a quarter of what it used to be. Let's try to run the game just for fun. You'll probably not see any difference. If we did more important things, this could be a significant improvement. I want to lower the time step to 1 30th. This is of course below the frame rate, so it's gonna look a little bit choppy. Then I'm gonna come out the instrumentation, because we don't we need that now. And then I'm gonna make myself invincible. So we're going to make the paddle height 500. Then I also want to comment out the instrumentation for the update method. And instead of logging that, I want to log the ball velocity when somebody wins. So score 
Velocity. And this.ball.ven. Hmm. We can say length there actually. No, well. So we get both the x and the y component. I also want to edit the ball collision velocity increase to 1.25. Let's run. Boink. Faster. 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 At some point. There we go. The ball traveled through player 2. So I finally beat the AI here. Kind of. Here we can see that the ball x velocity was 1149. I think if we increase the simulation accuracy by lowering the time step, this should be higher. So let's try this. Here we go. And I'm gonna put it to 1 to 40th of a second. That is eight times as accurate as we just had. I think the x-velocity will need to be much higher in order for the ball to escape. Okay, so we're bouncing, we're bouncing, we're bouncing, and it's going crazy over here. Boom! Yes! 7712. Let's make another test. Unfortunately, I didn't win that round. 14,000! Whoa. Okay, I think I proved my point. Okay, I want to show one last improvement I think we should do. Back to the code here. First, I'm gonna rename the update method to simulate. And simulate is now blindly just gonna simulate the time it is given. Instead, we're gonna have an update method separate from simulate. Update dt. And here we're gonna apply the accumulator concept. This dot accumulator plus equals delta time. Then the while loop while this dot accumulator is more than this dot step. Then we call simulate with step this dot simulate this dot step. And then lastly we decrease the accumulator. Now we just need to initialize the step and accumulators in the constructor. Zero this dot step equals one twentieth. And now we just need to modify this. We can remove this accumulator and this step. We're gonna copy this directly into the update method as it was before, and then clean up the code that isn't used. There we go. Let's see if this works now. It does. So one last proof. Let's comment out the update method here again. So now we don't have any simulation. All simulation is manual. And now we simulate manually. Pong.update. And let's say 15 60th, quarter of a second. There it flew away. Boom. We go closer. And now even if I give a huge update time here, it should not go through the player. Let's give it half a second. There, it worked. And why did it work? Because in the update method, in the update method, we make sure that everything that needs to happen for an accurate simulation is being done. So the simulation callback is actually called here, I think, 60 times. And that is how you create a solid game timer.